Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with Thank memory loss. Thank you for joining me, Gina. Thank you for having me. So Gina is with the Bob and Diane Fund, and we're going to talk about that shortly. But first, I thought Gina could maybe tell us how her family, tell us about your family's caregiving journey. Yes. Well, thank you. So my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's when she was 65 years old, which was, I think, in 2006. And um, her and my father um, were high school sweethearts, happily married for, um, at the time of her passing, almost 50 years. Um, And I live in Washington, D.C. They lived in California, where my other siblings lived. And we're a pretty close family. And when she was diagnosed, I remember the doctors telling my dad that he saw shrinkage of the brain, which we all know is the signs of Alzheimer's or dementia. And we all kind of um, came together to kind of help him and plan, you know, how to care for her. And he was her sole caregiver through her entire five-year illness. And I say five-year illness because that really is not that long to live with the disease. Um, we were, I, I tend to say thankful, but my siblings don't, but we, she had gotten, um, cancer and, um, was given maybe three months, but died about seven weeks later. So that is why she didn't live as long with Alzheimer's. But my dad was her sole caregiver. And we he was just getting to the point where he wanted to put her into a home. And um, this was in September when she was diagnosed with cancer. And he had just been thinking about putting her in in the next month or two. So that changed those plans. And we all agreed to keep her at home, which was still him taking care of her. But it was only for, you know, another month and a half or so. So, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say that I was a caregiver 3000 miles away, but I like to think that I was because I was very involved with their lives and talked to them every day. And I flew home once a month. Um but yeah, and you know, unfortunately, <laughs> it was all mostly put on my dad. So that was our family experience with caregiving. Well, flying cross country on a monthly, especially nowadays when we yes. don't do that at all. Well, you just did, but for the most part, most of us aren't haven't flown for quite some time. Yeah, it was definitely pre-pandemic. She passed in 2011. um, And I had a very understanding boss who just let me work remotely from California. So I was there probably eight days every month. So, um, you know, and felt very involved in her daily care and doctor's appointments and all of that. And just to kind of follow up on The caregiving role, as most people know who have been through it, you really, what's hardest is on the caregiver than the person living with the disease. Mm -hmm. And my dad um, had a bad heart. He had rheumatic fever when he was nine. So his heart was never 100%. So during my mother's illness, we were quite concerned about him more. And so we always tried to make sure he had a day off with my mom to go golf and, you know, made sure we, he took care of himself. And, you know, after she passed in on October 31st, 2011, um, just three months later on his 71st birthday, which was their first birthday, not together since they were 17 or 18. Um, he was out to dinner with my brother and had dinner and dessert and they brought him a cake. He made a wish. He blew out the candle and he dropped dead of a heart attack within the hour. So, I mean, that also says something about what the stress of caregiving is on the caregiver. Um, But it also says it was also the perfect ending to their 50 plus relationship that they were, he obviously wanted to be with her. um, And that was his birthday wish. I was just thinking that I was like, oh, do I, do I ask if you wonder what the wish was? But yeah, apparently yeah, you yeah. thought about that. So yeah. to back up a half step, okay. he said he was considering putting her in a care residence. Mm-hmm. 
what was the catalyst of of that thought process? Because I know a lot yeah. of people struggle with with that. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there was actually a catalyst. Um, he was pretty much able to care for her. Um, we were fortunate in the fact that she still remembered who we were when she passed and she never got violent. She got um, angry a couple of times, but nothing too bad. And he did experience once, which he had never experienced before is she had a seizure mm. um, and that made him nervous. Um, he ended up getting, having someone come into the home. Um, I'm trying to think if it was daily or maybe a few times a week. I can't remember for maybe eight hours. And she fought that she mm -hmm. did not think she needed that. But what we said was, remember that seizure you had, this is the doctor said we had to have this. And then she's like, Oh, okay. Um, I, but it was nothing, I, not that I can think of. Um, I think maybe he just thought she was only gonna, going to get worse and knew what his limits were. Um, yeah, I think that's what kind of prompted it. And it was only maybe two miles away from them. So it was close. Um, and, but it was going to be a very hard decision. It always is, is. Yes, it always is. And it's expensive. That doesn't help at all. No. But a lot of caregivers I've talked to, ones that are part of my support group, what I've noticed is you get sucked in. It's almost like quicksand. You, yeah. you're, you're helping take, you know, like for you and me and my sister for some part, you know, you're helping your parent take care of your other parent. And then like my dad passed away with no conversation whatsoever about what would happen, what we would do with my mother if he mm. went first, which since he had diabetes and he had all kinds of chronic Other issues. issues. Yeah. Yeah. It was definitely, you know, a conversation we should have had. So I'm a huge advocate of having these conversations. They're very difficult to start, but I think most people find that you've had these conversations and, you know, they're not a warm, fuzzy feeling, but you come away a little bit relieved. Like, okay, I understand where they're coming from. They understand where I'm coming from. Now we can make plans or, oh, yeah. we agree. <laughs> Shocker. We agree on stuff, which not, that's we, not my family. <laughs> we actually um, did discuss what we would do if my dad went first, because like we said, his, he had a bad heart. Um, and my brother ex expressed interest in taking my mom and which, you know, su surprised us, but that's what he, you know, he felt at the time. And we do, I mean, I tell all my friends to have these conversations, whether it's with Alzheimer's or cancer or just old age, to have these conversations with your parents while they can, financial conversations, where everything is, if they have a safe with the combination, because yeah. that was our problem. Um, but you have to, we always had these conversations growing up. You know, my dad would say, if I go first, I want your mom to do this. And my mom would say the same thing. They told us they both, they wanted to be cremated. Um, we were always very open about those things. And I really encourage my friends and others to do the same. It's so important. Do you feel that being open and understanding the technicalities, like what they wanted, um, the financial end, but also what their wishes and stuff were, did that make it less stressful to make decisions? A hundred percent. There you yes. go, folks. One hundred percent. My brother, sister, and I got along during that whole process afterwards of what we were going to do with everything. Um, yes. Um, completely. I even, you know, at 52 years old, um, what was it, a couple of years ago, probably when I was 49 or 50, I got, I did a living trust um, well before I hopefully need to, but I'm a planner and I have in there, if I get Alzheimer's, what to do with me, um, everything. So I do believe in having these open conversations before you need to and um yeah being honest about what's 
the future, especially when you have something like this in your family. Mm -hmm. Be prepared. We're we're signing our trust today. Oh, good. (laughs) And it was funny because I just turned 54. My husband's 56. And, you know, going through all of the questions, we only have one daughter. Mm-hmm. And so it, the, when he said, well, what happens if something happens to your daughter before you guys? And it was like, oh, that's a really yes. ugly question. But, but it's, you, you know, and you don't think of these things uh-uh. because that's not the natural order of life, but it does but happen. Things happen. Mm-hmm. I mean, my dad went, you know, preceded his mother. My paternal grandmother is almost 103. Wow. My dad didn't make it to 78. So, you know, the, it was, it was great that he asked that question, but it was like, wow, Ooh, that's a yeah. hard question to answer. Yes. You know, and, and so, but my husband joked, he goes, wow, I really feel like we're adulting, which is, a, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's one of those kids, th- millennial comments. So, yes. And I have an upcoming episode on an Alzheimer's living will. So you said, oh, you that's have, great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you, um, when that, episode comes out, people can click on the link and order their own because we did talk about that as well, which was actually a learning experience for the trust attorney. So we all learned something. That day. Yes. Oh, I love that. <laughs> so you have worked for National Geographic for probably longer than you want to admit. Oh, no. Um, it will be 21 years in January. Awesome. One of my favorite publications and because as a photographer I just love the Nat Nat Geo photography and is so tell me how you did did you combine these two passions and that's how you started the fund exactly okay so um working for National Geographic um I mean I loved photography well before that but really started appreciating photography um during my 21 year career And I collect photography. I have a huge collection of prints and photography books. I have over 950 photography books and I support photographers all the time. And I had been thinking about, I had some extra money at the time. This was five or so years ago and was thinking of um, supporting some photographers with it. And I was talking to a friend of mine about it. And he said, why don't you start a grant related to Alzheimer's and dementia and name it after your mom? And it just did not occur to me on my own. I don't know how that I didn't come up with that. And I loved that idea. Um, For one, there is no other, there's no grant like this out there. And there wasn't then, and there still isn't that supports projects related to Alzheimer's and dementia. And, but the other thing that I did is I wanted to name it after both of them because it Alzheimer's affected my father just as much as my mother. And as her caregiver, I just wanted to honor both of them. So the Bob and Diane fund was created in 2016 And it's, um, we give a $5,000 grant once a year to a photographer working on a story related to Alzheimer's um, or dementia. I usually say Alzheimer's because that's what my mom had, but it's really, we cover all forms of dementia. And um, the grant is to bring a visual awareness to this disease that so many people do not understand, as I know, you know, yeah, Um, it's just, unless you are living with it or have experienced it in some way, you truly do not understand what the disease is. Most people think it is just forgetting people's names or forgetting to turn off the coffee maker. It is so much more than that. It's a complete, I mean, complete personality change um, among so many other um, mental facilities. Um, And I wanted to be able to, by bringing a, a visual awareness to a disease, it makes people understand it more, gives them more empathy for that, for the people dealing with it. And it makes them want to care and then hopefully want to support financially to Alzheimer's organizations to help find a cure. Definitely. Did you, when you started in 2016, was it challenging to find photographers who are actually creating these kind of visual stories because I know myself as a like family historian photographer and 
many people on social media, some of the younger caregivers, and I say that reluctantly, <laughs> but <laughs> the ones that are in their 30s and 40s that grew up mm -hmm. with a lot more social media are less inhibited about showing the really negative side of the disease because, which is important. But, you know, for me, it was like, my mother would kill me if she knew what I'd put on the internet of her. I mean, I would get that mom look and I would be a pile of ash. That would just be yeah. the end of me. Yeah. And I have another gal who's just slightly younger than me that one of the things that she posted a lot in her Instagram is her journey with her dad. She moved him into a care home in January and he's had the disease for 12 years. So he's definitely getting closer to the end or, end or stages, end stages. And she is sharing a lot less of that because she wants him to have his privacy and his mm -hmm. dignity, which I thoroughly understand and agree with, but it does make it difficult to share the more challenging side of the disease. Yeah. Um, you know, when I started this, I had absolutely no idea if I was going to get five submissions a year or a thousand, not a clue. So when this was, um, when I started it, we were going to start submissions in August and I was fortunate enough that timemagazine.com announced our grant. So they announced that it was going to be open to, um, get submissions, which was great. So our first year we received over 70 and we always average about 25 countries, always anywhere between 22 and 27. And, um, so I was been really happy with, we average about that this year, we had, um, 73 submissions from 27 countries. It's a perfect number for me, um, to judge and all of that. Um, but yeah, I did it now. And again, it, this is work that already exists or is they're working on. It is not to start the work. So, um, you know, I, I, like I said, I didn't know what we were going to have at that point. So each year and every project has been different. So not everyone is really documenting a parent in, in decline. Like you mentioned, some do our first year winner, Maya Daniels in 2016 documented a hospital. Um, it was the secure unit of a hospital for Alzheimer's. And there was not that many difficult images to look at, except where they were standing at the door waiting for their parents or waiting for their loved ones. And I don't mean that that's not difficult, but I mean, ones where it was maybe not seeing them in a respectful, respectful light. Um, the second year, Chris Nunn, he documented a, a friend of his who he met, who was an artist in the town he lived in. And the third year, Stephen Dorado did photograph his father, but Stephen had been documenting his father for 20 plus years with a large format camera well before he was ever ill from dementia. He'd always done um, portraits and self-portraits with his father. Beautiful. So when his father became ill, he just continued it as if he'd, as he always had and um, just continued documenting his parents. Um, then our last year's winner in 2019, Sophie Matheson, she documented her grandparents and um, she did it in a beautiful way. Um, you know, there were some difficult moments with her grandmother, but it was all done very lovingly, I think. And then lastly, our new winner uh, or grantee for 2020, we just announced yesterday. He is um, from Iran, Jalal Shamsazarin. I think I'm pronouncing his last name right. And it is a lovely project on his father. Um, he documented him in black and white starting, I think, at, at the beginning of his illness, and he just recently passed away. But the images are, you know, very, they're gritty, but very tender and emotional as well. Um, and I think that he was able to document the disease, and still respecting his father's um, dignity, privacy, um, to, to his, his death and the way he photographed his death was more in um, kind of 
not abstract ways, but ways where it was like the empty picture frame or them driving to the cemetery. So those where you're not seeing the actual death, but you know that he has since passed on. Definitely. Now the first winner, I became aware of her because of an article in, well, it was in my news feed in the Apple news. Mm -hmm. My understanding is, is after documenting the, I'm not really sure what the right word is, the, the stress of looking through the windows Mm -hmm. into a hallway that they couldn't get into encouraged the hospital. This is in France to put in different doors that didn't have windows. Is that true? Do you know, I have not heard that. I think that was, it's been, it's been many months. Might've been. That is so interesting. I think they changed the doors so that it wasn't like a, a yeah, it wasn't a forbidden portal to the outside. That's, I think that's really important. And if that's the, I love that. Um, I will research that that is so interesting yeah maya's work so maya is swedish but she did this work in a hospital in northern france and it was a protective unit and the um, patients would be kind of dressed up with holding their bags waiting for a loved one to come pick them up as if they were leaving but they weren't and pulling on the door and the door was locked and you could see the wear and tear on the door and i mean it's just it's a beautiful project. Um, but it's difficult too. it's difficult to look at just seeing people kept in a protective unit. But again, I think she did it, did it beautifully and um, with a very tender touch to it. It was interesting. And I don't know if it was because it was France, it seemed very timeless, like the way they were dressed, it didn't scream yes. the it 2000 was, you're, whatever's. <laughs> you're absolutely right. It, it was And so was, um, I feel like our second grantee, Chris Nunn's work feels very timeless to me. He'd met met this gentleman, I think in a grocery store, and he was a known painter in their area. And Chris must have known he'd been um, um, diagnosed with dementia and asked to document him. And he said yes. And they worked together for quite a while and just did these beautiful portraits and moments where time just went by and he was able to um, document that. It's, it's just beautiful. Well, but we're excited. Oh, sorry. Well, for everybody that would like to see these images, first off, you can see the current grantee on the YouTube channel, but you can also go to the Bob and Diane Funds website, which is linked yep. in the show notes. And all of the past winners have galleries, which you can look at. And they are very... They're touching, they're, it's, they're documentary photography. They're not beautiful portraits all the time. And that's fine. And it's important. But Alzheimer's is not beautiful. No, not at <laughs> or all. Or dementia, yes. But there are beautiful images. And there's always, I mean, whether you have dementia or other diseases, there's always a beautiful moment that your loved one is having. And so it's just like the images, there are some beautiful moments in it and there's other images that are difficult. Um, but that's, that's the honest truth of this disease. Now, have you seen any or talked to any people that have learned from these projects? They've seen them and they're like, wow, I didn't know. I mean, are you seeing like the the end result? Oh, great. Tell me about that. I think so. I mean, I see the end result in my everyday life, which means so many people who I am connected to, which in the world of photography, it could be worldwide. So many people are more aware of Alzheimer's and dementia because people who I'm friends with on social, who I may not actually know, but (laughs) we're in the same community are always sending me things about Alzheimer's always. And I love that. I love that they do think of me when they read a story about Alzheimer's. Um, And so many people are always asking, how's the Bob and Diane doing? How's the Bob? So I love that people know my parents' name, but yes, I always read comments. So every year the Washington post announces our winner 
And I always read those comments and I've read so many where people say that how much it's touched them and how they didn't understand. And when I say I want to bring a visual awareness, especially to the world, but I also want to bring it to the lives of caregivers. So meaning for you, if though you're not a caregiver at this time, but when you were, your neighbor will now understand what you're going through and your coworker will understand because they don't get it and the way they interact with you. So yes, I want people in the world to understand it, but I also want the caregiver's immediate community to understand what that person is going through. Um, I think that is so important. Um, I would have some of my mom's friends say, oh, your mom hurt my feelings today, you know, and they call me about this. And I is like, if you don't have thick skin, do not call her because I can't take on that added stress of hearing about it. So you need to understand what it is that we are dealing with on a daily basis. So the caregiver obviously needs support from the family, but also their community. Mm hmm for their community to understand what they are going through. And I do feel that these um, visual images help people understand that. It's yeah. I've talked to so many people that are, they're just essentially clueless and it's not Mm -hmm. because they don't care. It's just because it hasn't touched them or I'm assuming since your mom was only sick with Alzheimer's for five years and then got cancer, she was not, didn't get into the later stages. No. I mean, she was, she was definitely declining. Um, I mean, the Alzheimer's had definitely progressed, but like I said, she still knew who we were. I mean, I would say 75 to 80% of the time, once in a while she'd ask, you know, not know something, but, um, she knew most and she, um, yeah, she didn't get into that really angry stage. She never, she drifted off to the neighbors only twice, I think, which wasn't too bad. Um, so, you know, we knew how much worse it could get. So we were fortunate in that way that she didn't live longer with the disease. And I do feel that is as that we were fortunate that she got cancer and had to, yeah. It's not a term you hear very often. (laughs) I know, I know. But when you are living with Alzheimer's, you well know. Um, But I was going to say, I'd read this this statistic late recently, and I thought it was so interesting between 2000 and 2018, deaths from heart disease have decreased 7.8% while deaths from Alzheimer's have increased 146%. Yep. I think that is just shocking. It's ugly. And you're, you live in the DC in DC Mm -hmm. right now you're in California 2020 aside, because obviously this year we're not even going to discuss the, (laughs) we're not going to discuss deaths this year. Alzheimer's can either be the second or third leading cause of death of Californians. Yeah. I, I, I do believe a lot of that is a function of population, bigger mm-hmm. number of people. Obviously we're going to have more Alzheimer's and dementia, but yeah, it's, it's the sixth leading cause sixth. of death nationwide. Yes. Yeah. Which, and it's higher than breast cancer, pancreas, the three, top three uh, cancers, breast cancer, prostate. Were, and yeah, I think those two combined. Okay. Maybe it's just the two. That's why I can't come yeah. up with the third and then, um, and heart disease. So it's like, yeah. you know, we've done a great job on reducing heart disease of coming up with therapies for cancers. And unfortunately we all know lifestyle choices are very important yeah. in maintaining mm-hmm. our health. Yes. And say that two days before the biggest eating day of the year. <laughs> yeah. Um, and since our winner is uh, based in Iran, Iran has 750,000 people living with the disease, um, which, you, you know, happen to know the population of Iran. I don't, <laughs> okay. but somebody, you know, I meant to look that up because someone else asked me that, but I thought it to me, it's still, that's a lot 700, of 750,000 is too many. Um, but it's, you know, it's a disease that's worldwide as I fa- have found when I get submissions from so many different countries. I mean, like I said, this year was 27 different countries. 
And do they document this is going to, this is a, it's kind of the wrong way to ask it, but do you see a difference, like a cultural difference in how they document it? Or is it all fairly documentary style? It's um, no, it's not all documentary style. We definitely get um, some more fine art approaches, portrait approaches. Um, some will do, there's one project that's been submitted. It's just of flowers. And, you know, once I read the proposal, I understood it, it was, you know, each flower represented um, something with dementia, but there was nobody with dementia in the images. Um, I've received some different like art type projects that still have photography in them, like collages. And um, I tend to um, be drawn more to the documentary and um fine art side of documenting this disease. Um, I, you know, just from my photography background, but I also don't do the judging. I have um, two of our board members um, and we do one guest judge a year. Although this year with COVID, I had one judge, um, Jared Soros, who is a photojournalist based in Washington, DC. He came and judged the work and we wore our Bob and Diane fun masks. And um, so this year was a little different. If this year is a little different, no matter what we're doing. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Did I read, and I apologize for my brain having a glitch. Have That's they, okay. have these been um, um, hung in a gallery? What is the right word? They exhibited. There you go. They have not yet been exhibited. This is our fifth year. And um, I have had a couple of opportunities and I always said, I'm going to wait till maybe five years and then COVID happened. <laughs> but the grant is to help finish the work to help get it published into a book form or to help exhibit it. So one of the, um, our third grantee, Stephen Dorado did publish a book with dad um, with help of the grant, which was wonderful. And I think Jalal was hoping to publish th this project into a book form, but yes, that is definitely on my radar in the next year or so. I would love to get this work exhibited. We've talked to um, us against Alzheimer's, maybe doing it at their yearly um, con um, convention. So I do want to say two other things that we do is that we give a thousand dollars or actually more. We, um, give scholarships to non-Western photographers to attend uh, photography workshops in around the world. So we have done three where we pay their membership or their um, enrollment fee and airfare from Mexico, Bangladesh, and India to go to either, um, I think it was Kenya, and then there was a workshop in India. So we've done that, which has been great. And then they have to do a project on Alzheimer's for the week. And then last year was our first year where we did a photo contest called Still Living. And it was a contest for people living with the disease. And you may think, how can that be? But there are people who live with it in the you know early stages where they are still functioning people in the community. And that is what we wanted to remind people that for stills, for still photography and still that they are still living. They still have a voice. They still contribute. So um, we did, it was worldwide and we chose three winners, um, one in France and Canada, and then the U S and um, gave them a small financial prize. And we had hoped to do it again, but with COVID, we knew that wasn't going to work with um, people in homes and uh, caregiving homes. But um, so, you know, we definitely want to do more things with people living with like more photo opportunities. One gentleman who um, was kind of a budding photographer had, had not picked up his camera in years and he did the photo contest and he wrote me and he was fine that he did not win. He just loved that he was able to pick up his camera again and it got him interested in photography again. So. And that was a person and, living with dementia. Yes. Yep. I had an yeah. episode with the, I don't know if it's foundation is probably not the right word. It's a group called make grandma smile. Hmm. Their goal is to, improve senior activities in care communities Yep, because 
they don't seem to have modernized. Like my mm -hmm. mom was 77 when she died this year and they were playing big band music a lot, which she did like, but yes, that was not her era. Yeah. And, and we're getting to the point of the scary thought, you know, where the sixties and the seventies are going to be mm -hmm. the music and the cultural, you know, parts of the past. And one of the things he said was, thank God forbid, I get dementia or Alzheimer's. He would want to make sure that I would have a camera that I could use and just take pictures of whatever. And just, he yeah. said, it doesn't have to be anything spectacular. It's just, you know, it just, it helps engage people. So they're not exactly. just around. Yeah. So it's, you know, I, get, I this, see all these connections coming yes. together. Yes. Um, for that contest, the theme was what inspires you, what brings you joy. And so we got pictures of cat, you know, their pet, their cat. And one woman who lives with the disease, she started a kayak club hmm. and um, it was a picture of her on her kayak, uh, not of her from um, the tip of her kayak to a beautiful um, background and, or foreground, I should say. And, yeah, I just, I love that. Um, there's another woman I met with the disease and she is definitely loves photography. I would call her maybe a little bit more than an amateur photographer and she loves hummingbirds and she goes out and photographs hummingbirds and other birds. And, um, and that keeps her stimulated and, you know, moving and, I think that is so important. And there are some camera clubs within some organizations and, um, but yeah, I would love to do more with that. That's camera clubs incorporating, you know, somebody in earlier to middle stages would actually be a really a good community kind of outreach mm -hmm. to do my mm -hmm. cycle club for a while. One of the gentlemen who lived near this particular residence would go and ride bikes with this gentleman because he had been an avid cycler and he was kind of a flight risk for lack of a better term, because, you know, it's like, I think you almost have muscle memory, like, Oh, I got to get out on my bike. I'm a cyclist too. So I can kind of relate to that feeling. And he, his children were still working. They were sandwich generation with their own kids and they would ride with him on the weekend, but he needed more stimulation. Mm -hmm. And so, this one gentleman in our club rode with him once a week. And so oh, that's those great. Are also the kind of things that we as, you know, people in the community can do to help caregivers, people living with Alzheimer's or dementia. And, you know, and it, it's good for us too. You know, yeah, when yeah. we reach out to help somebody, we actually get quite a bit in return. A so, absolutely. Well, tell me about the gentleman from Ireland that got, did I get a, did he get a grant in January this year? Cause I loved oh, his work. Oh, okay. So Paul John Bayfield. So he's from the UK, he's from the UK, um, England. And, um, so I had met Paul at geographic, um, maybe a year before and we had not really talked a lot, but so I didn't really know his story. And then last a year ago, he was at National Geographic. And so he and I sat and had a nice long conversation. He is, um, you know, I think in his thirties and was the sole caregiver of his mother who um, had Pick's disease. And I could not imagine being the sole caregiver of my parent at that age. And mm -mm. he, they didn't have family around and I don't think they had a large network of friends in their area. So he was, a, he's a freelance photographer, but he couldn't afford to take jobs because if he left her, he had to pay to have someone come in. So his career was definitely affected by this. And I don't think she had much, I don't think they had much financial support from her, you know, social security or what have you. So um, I had talked to our board during that week when he was in town and suggested, you know, ask, can we help him out? So we decided to give him a mentorship grant and um, on our board is Sarah Lean, the former director of photography for National Geographic Magazine. She was going to mentor him, his project. And he had submitted the project um, prior. And it's a beautiful project. It just wasn't ready yet. 
And so she has been working with him and trying to get a little bit more intimate images with his mother and more like um, of her, of her, of her things in her home and mem memorabilia stuff. And he'd been documenting almost every day since she was diagnosed, he had been traveling when she was diagnosed, he came home, flew home, they, you know, discussed what the disease was and what they're going to have to do. And he said, let's do this documentation together. And he's been documenting her through her from um, diagnosis on, and it is really beautifully done. Um, but again, as her sole caregiver, I just, I felt such empathy for him. So I wanted to give him some financial relief. And so we gave him a, a nice size grant and, to, so he could focus on that and focus on her. And unfortunately she passed away this year, mm -hmm. um, just, just recently in the last month and a half or so, but I should go back. She was in a, um, a rehab home right when COVID came, um, started. So they would not release her. They had to keep her in there and they were not financially prepared for that. So, you know, they had to make that work and she definitely declined while she was in this home. She would not eat without Paul because it's just been the two of them. He's her only child. And um, so he, the, the nurses would call him and said, she's just not eating. And he had her put near a window and he brought a table to the other side of the window outside a folding table, a chair, a tablecloth, a little vase. And he would bring a full meal, not McDonald's, but he would have a plate, you know, utensils and eat his meal on the other side of the window. So she would eat and she always ate when he did. And he did portraits of them eating together through the glass window. And I, it's just stunning. Mm -hmm. And he's been getting wonderful acknowledgement and press of this work. And um, we're still working on it. He's still working with um, S Sarah and we want to continue the, you know, the work she has since passed, but continue the work of her belongings that he is going through and then um, get that into hope. I think he's working towards getting it into a book form to help others with whether it's Pick's disease or other types of dementia, but he's been getting wonderful press and um, yeah, he's just a beautiful person and such a loving and caring son. I mean, when I met him, he had a broke, he had his arm in a sling because he had to shower her uh. and they were in the shower together. And I don't know if he just fell or if they both fell, but when he fell, he broke his arm and um so it's just, it's a sad story, but also a beautiful story of their relationship and how he was able to do this project with her until the very end. But it's one of the first documentations that I know of from diagnosis to death. Well, I also liked that it documents the challenges of caring for people with Alzheimer's, dementia, Pick's disease. Mm-hmm in this insane COVID time. Yes. I yes. am so grateful. Uh -huh. uh, my mom, my mom fell, broke her leg and passed away on March 31st, 2020, because I would always take her out. Her joy was to watch kids. I always mm -hmm. joke that we were the creepy old ladies watching the kids. We'd watch the kids at the pool. So, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> sometimes people would like, look at me like, mm, I don't know if you're a little odd, but that's what she loved. She was a mom. She was a grandma. Yeah. So what brought her joy and that's yeah you know, we'd, we'd go to different parks because i would get bored but that wasn't an option and going in the care home wasn't an option and you know it was just like and who knows i mean here we are it's been almost eight months since she died yeah. and you know We're i've still been in it yeah it's like you know <laughs> i kind of laughed my sister has a may birthday and i you know snarkily laugh to myself he 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 I, you know you're you have to have a covid birthday but uh, you know i'll probably be you know i'll be in the clear Pfft, so much for that yeah. don't be a snarky witch i guess is my <laughs> my lesson there but i just i can't imagine what people are going through it's well and, and the people all day the ones who are mm -hmm. still living with their loved one 
um, and may have kids at home still now too. So they have their parent with dementia and kids and working from home. I, I, I just could not imagine that stress. No. Uh, yeah. But I think it's important. And unfortunately those people don't have time to document this insanity unless that's yeah. their job, but it's, you know, it, one of the things when, after my father passed away and we put my mom in the care residence, it dawned on me because he had, he always did the typical annual Christmas photo and he they'd come over to my studio and we would do the photo with them and the dog. And that was between the, my mom and the dog. It was like, Ugh. and my dad wasn't physically flexible and cooperative, if that makes sense to uh -huh. people. You know, I would try to get him in certain positions that were more flattering and, you know, being my dad, he just blew me away. So it's like, no, 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 I'm going to sit like this. And then I had to like coax a smile out of my mom. It was, and being a creative and being an artist, I always wanted, it's like, well, that's, that's what we did last year. Let's do something different, which of yeah. course was a stupid way to think, but after we didn't get that in 2016 and it dawned on me not long after we moved her that if I didn't keep photographing mm -hmm. her, she would effectively disappear from family history after he died. Now, she died three years and basically a month after him. So, you know, there wasn't a huge amount of history, but mm -hmm. there was enough. And, yeah. you know, I've been looking back on it, you know, Thanksgiving last year. And I had my mom. I had our oldest dog. You know, and it's like... This year has yeah. just been too much, but it's just, it's important. And yeah. I'm really glad after my mom passed away, you, you, and I did this with the dog too. It's like, I went and looked at all the pictures I took of her and all of the little videos, even the ones that I took, like we, we were talking about offline, I think about, you know, the videos of the non-flattering. Yeah. And the ugly, the yeah, ugly side. Yeah. And I, I looked at them and, and I really had a sense of peace because I'm like, I really, really, really had a lot of success in bringing her joy. Cause of course, after people die, you're like, you know, she was really, really hard at the end and mm -hmm. we moved and there was just tired and stress. And one time, she, like not long before she fell and broke her leg, she told me to drop dead. She clawed my husband, drew blood on him. That was his last interaction with her. So I've read recently that when we have an event or, you know, something happens, if it ends on a negative note, the mm. whole thing is tainted. And, mm. and so I'm trying to help some people through some situations where it starts off negative, but they're able to distract or deflect yeah. or, you know, turn the event around or distraction is a key word. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's some people I'm talking to that, their parents just yell and swear at them and they're just very ugly. And that's really hard to deal with. I mean, yeah. I know I got it a little bit, but not nearly what these guys are dealing with. And this, I guess one gal just went off just, you know, she'd had the, the straw broke the camel's back. She vented all of her stress and frustration and sadness at her poor mother. Mm -hmm. And her mother actually stood there and took it which is pretty surprising for somebody with a broken brain. Mm -hmm. And so it ended on a positive note. So after reading this social media post, I said, when, when we have an event that's positive, but it ends negative, they remember that negative feeling. So take yeah. away from this that it started off very ugly, understandably, mm -hmm. but it ended with some understanding and hugs and I love yous. So your mom is going to remember that part of it she's gonna mm -hmm. forget that you are ugly you know mm -hmm. and i don't say that as a negative thing because trust me yeah, yeah. <laughs> very difficult not to be sometimes yeah so i was trying to let her know that you know maybe not try to vent so harsh at your mom again but you didn't do permanent damage so yeah and i to tie this back into what you guys are doing it's you know yes the pictures can be a little challenging to look at. I mean, they're definitely not, they're not beautiful all the time, they're but they flowers they, and rainbows No, unfortunately, but it, it really does help, you know, educate the population and inform and make it less scary. And I think yeah. that's super important. Thank you. I tell people that, you know, 
I, you know, I lost my parents, both of them within three months and it was tough. I was 43, 42 or 43. And I handled it better than I ever thought I could. I felt such I felt such appreciation and I was so grateful that I had the parents that I had and that they were together that I celebrated them more than I mourned them. Um, and never in my dreams did I think that I could have done that, but my parents were the most giving people I knew and not just to my brother, sister and I, but to their community around them and their friends and family, they were very, very giving people. And I like to think that they taught me the gift of giving, and this is my gift to them. Well, it's a wonderful gift. How can people that are hearing this story for the first time, how can they connect with you guys, help you guys? Yeah. So please go on our website, which is bobanddianefund.org. We're on all social media um, as the same, Bob and Diane Fund. And if you are into photography and you're working on a project, please, please apply for the grant. We usually open submissions end of August, early September, and we announce the winner every November for National Caregivers Month. So, you know, please consider that, Um, you know, if you just appreciate it, share it, you know, on your social medias and wherever. And if you know of a place to get it published, you can reach out to me. My contact information's on there. I do work really hard to get this work published worldwide. Um, And if you want to give, we are a 501c3 and it's um, the end of the year. So if you need a tax write-off, there is a donation um, section on the website. So that is always appreciated. So we could just keep giving more and bringing more visual awareness um, to this disease. Terrific. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. I enjoyed talking to you when we first met over Zoom and this time again. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.